Hello, and welcome to the 166th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday, the 23rd of September, 2021, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week, I'm delighted to welcome Michael Albert to the show to talk about Paracon and his new book, No Bosses. This is the first of three episodes with Michael, where we ease into the topic before we jump off into an extremely detailed debate on the planning aspects of Paracon. Parts 2 and 3 will be released next week, part 3 of which being a Patreon-only episode. Speaking of Patreon, this week I have the new patrons William McGrew, TM and Mark Owen to thank. If you like listening to extra Patreon-only episodes, creating Discord over on the Discord server or joining in future reading groups, head on over to the Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Okay, to the interview. Okay, I'm uh, glad to welcome Michael Albert to the show here today. One of the co-founders of Participatory Economics, or Paricon. Michael, you've got a new book coming out in the next couple of weeks slash month. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, well, it's called No Bosses, A New Economy for a Better World. And it attempts to, again, present and make a case for this different approach post-capitalist approach, participatory socialist approach, whatever you want to call it, to doing economics. And, you know, why another one? Well, I'm trying in this case to be as concise and as compelling as I can. And, you know, I hope I succeeded in that, that effort. We won't know, I guess, until the book's out and people cast judgment on it. Am I right in saying the original, the Paricon, Life After Capitalism, did that get like into the New York bestsellers list? It's a funny story. No. When the book first came out, it did very, very well, very quickly. And that was because at the time, Zenet, um, which I work at, was much larger and more prominent, I suppose you could say. And so the promotion pushed the book really well. And there's, there's maybe two really sort of interesting stories. I went into Harvard Square early in the experience. The, the book is doing really well. There's a hunger for, you know, this alternative kind of vision. I said, how well? And he said, well, it's the second best-selling book in the store right now. And what was fascinating about this wasn't anything about this specific book, I think. It was that for some reason somebody in the store decided to put a stack of them on the table, actually two stacks of them on the table. And that's all it took. You know, w- once it was that visible and people were sort of t- picking it up and taking a look at it, people decided that they wanted to get it. The alternative situation, which is the usual situation, is that the store orders two books and puts them someplace hidden in the back shelves And after a week or two, one of them sells, and maybe they'll order two more, and maybe they won't. So the lesson here for me was that there was a there's a hunger, but it's a hunger that doesn't rush to get. In other words, it doesn't find you. Let's say you do a book on economic vision, doesn't find your book. But if your book is put in front of it, people are interested. And so the same situation still prevails, I think. But so it was a unique experience, and it had to do with the times. And the prominence, I think, of Zenet at the time, and so on. After that, however, it did much worse. Honestly, there wasn't enough follow-up. Do you mean from yourself or from other people, like a, a, like a, a movement or whatever? Well, I don't want to talk about this a lot, but I, in my impression, it was Verso. Verso was the publisher. And the book went out of print, was delayed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There was a lot of problems. And that was very disturbing. But in any event, that was a long time ago. And uh, this book, well, we'll see what happens in a month or so, you know, once it's been out for a bit. So how much, how many years of work went into coming up with the ideas in participatory economics? That's a hard question to answer. You know, some of the ideas in, let's call it the latest rendition, are recent. And so you could say 30 years, right? But that's not true, right? This isn't rocket science. It isn't all that incredibly difficult. The core of it was relatively quickly. Robin Hanel and I were in the movement of the 60s, very, very active in diverse ways. And we got 
you know, we, we, we continually encountered from everybody, particularly our elders, the question, well, okay, look, we get it. We get that you don't like what we have. We get that you don't like capitalism. It's not, you know, we can see that, but what are you for? And the question was asked in a way that was quite aggressive and that was meant to shut you up because since you didn't have an answer, you had no right to speak. And our first response to that was, well, that's ridiculous. If, if I'm a slave living under slavery, I don't have to know what the alternative for dealing with cotton is to be an abolitionist. It's got to go. And the same thing is true for imperialism and for capitalism. I can see the damage. This is 1967 or so, 68, right? I can see the damage, and I know it has to go. And it's, it's not incumbent on me to have all those answers. And we thought we were right morally, and I think we were. And we were sort of right, I suppose you could say, intellectually, and we were. We were wrong strategically. The question was a fair question. And it was a question that, while some people asked it to shut us up, other people asked it because they sincerely wanted to know. They sincerely wanted to know, is there something, is there something that you're for that I could be for? And we were much too lax in trying to address that concern. And I think the movement has been much too lax in trying to address that in school. And you can say for the whole duration of this period of time, not just about economics, but about, say, race or gender or politics. It's not that we need a blueprint. A blueprint is too much. It's not possible. It, it overextends, et cetera, et cetera. But to be able to express to people, well, look, I, I don't like what is, but mainly here's, here's what I prefer, including the basic institutions, the basic defining features in a compelling, in, in a way that is convincing as to its viability and its worthiness. After all, if you don't have some place where you're going, where are you going? No, I fundamentally completely agree. Like, I think it's a major achievement, a major work to the area of like having a decentralized planned economy. It's one of the few major attempts that's been done probably in the last 50, 60 years. Is that a fair comment? Well, I suppose it's not for me to judge, but you're asking me. And I think it is a fair comment. I think if you look at there are many books which even say they're about socialism, right? And they're about a vision and so on. And if you look on the shelves and you look at those, nine times out of 10, even more, the book is overwhelmingly about what's wrong with capitalism. It's about over or racism or whatever it is that it's... It's critique. It's, it's critique. Yeah, it's critique. Now, it's not bad critique. It's compelling critique. And yet, that compelling critique only, only reaches so many people. Because there are other people who, in their gut, know that everything's broken. They know that oppression hurts, that poverty hurts, that you know war hurts, and so on and so forth. People know these things. What they don't know is that there's any alternative. Margaret Thatcher's, you know, there is no alternative, is not new to Margaret Thatcher. That has been the bulwark of you know the 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 glue of existing systems for centuries, right? It's, do I want to take time? Do I want to even take risks? Do I want to, you know, step outside and away from where my family may be, from where some of my friends may be, to think these dissident thoughts and then to act on them? Well, no, I don't want to if it's not going anywhere. I don't want to do it just for the sake of doing it. I want to do it if I believe in it, and all too many people don't believe. And I think that that's, that's fair, and that it's a shame that so many on the left, so talented and so capable, have spent too much of their time trying to convince people of things that people already more or less believe, and not trying to deal with the impediment that people don't believe in a better world. Yeah, a lot of the critique ends up being a kind of a media consumption. Yeah, I mean, I don't know all the reasons. I've asked people this often. And so, for instance, one answer that I hear a lot is that it's easier. In other words, if I'm going to write a book or if I'm going to write an article, right, 
and it's about a topic. If it's about what's wrong, well, I know, right? And I've got lots of references I can use. And I'm not in danger of being wrong, right? I'm going to be right. If I'm going to write about what we should do, you know, to have a world free of racism or free of sexism or free of economic classes, now I'm on more difficult grounds. And I may even be wrong. I may say something that's just not defensible. So one explanation is that people don't want to do that. Another explanation is that people feel that it's it just it's too divorced from today. For reading the the books here now, for me, like the 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 most powerful thing about them is the kind of objective nature of some of the stuff that's in there, like the idea of an economy whereby a selfish action is not really distinguishable from an altruistic action in the system where you know like this idea of these objective things like the job complex can you explain to the listeners like what is the real strength behind the the job complex that i think a lot of people don't really get i think they think it's just sounds like a nice idea well i think you're right uh, and i think a lot of people resist it or don't get it you know one or the other there's a lot of resistance against this idea also it it owes it goes all the way back to early anarchists who would talk about an intellectual elite taking over. Now, it's changed. That's not the way I talk about it at all. But still, they had this this idea of something other than just owners, something other than just capitalists having tremendous power and, and being in a position to dominate. For me, it started with Barbara and John Ehrenreich, who wrote an essay, maybe 1972, something like that. And then there was a book between labor and capital. It was done by South End Press, where I was. Robin and I did an article in that book. And that was the first time that we were talking about this stuff. The idea is not that complicated. It's not complicated at all, actually. But let's take it back a step. So all Marxists will say, look, the economy, by its intrinsic characteristics, can divide people into opposed groups with different interests called classes. So far, so good. I agree. Uh, One of the the factors in that, at least one of the factors, is ownership. Again, so far, so good. So they identify the people who own the means of production, who own the workplaces, and they say that's the owners, that's the capitalists, and the workers. And forever, there has been this sort of focus on these two classes. There's been refinements and, you know, complications, but it's been basically around these two classes. And the notion is, well, capitalism elevates the interests of capitalists, and socialism elevates the interests of workers and gets rid of capitalists. And Robin and I, all the way back in, you know, late 60s, began to feel like this was just way too simple, and that there was something fundamentally wrong. And it was partly because the thing that had been called socialism and was being called socialism at that time to our eyes, in no way elevated the interests of working people. But it did get rid of capitalists. It was the case that people didn't own the means of production anymore. And we looked and decided, well, yeah, but using that initial idea, that initial observation that these institutions can divide people, the division of labor is such that about 20%, and that's a fair number, about 20%, do overwhelmingly what we called empowering work. And about 80% do overwhelmingly disempowering work. That meaning, on the one hand, work that gives you information, connections to others, relations to decisions, and so on, that's empowering. On the other hand, work that's boring, tedious, rote, disconnects you from others, etc., is disempowering. And when we looked, it seemed to us, well, wait a second, In the old Soviet Union and in those countries, this is really the class structure. This class has been elevated to ruling status. And people doing working class jobs are still in subordinate position. And then when we looked at our own society, we decided, well, you know, it's here too. The ruling class is the capitalists, the owners. But between them and workers is this other group the coordinator class. 
So that was the picture we had. And then the next question was, and like you say, there's an attempt in the way we write to argue from values and simply logically. So in this case, we say to ourselves, well, if we want to have things we believe in, like self-management and solidarity and equity from the economy, if we want the economy to produce that, if we want the economy to be classless, then just like Marxists rightfully understood, you have to get rid of private ownership because private ownership yields class division and then destroys all those values. You also have to get rid of this distinction between a coordinator class and a working class. And when we looked at that, I think the only thing hard about participatory economics is you have to think outside the box, but they're not complicated thoughts. The owners had property. What do the coordinator class have? Empowering work. What's the solution? Disperse the empowering work. You know, it's it's a two, it's it, barely a two-step logical discussion. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's not complicated. And now you might have some trouble figuring out. Okay, what does that what does that mean? What does it mean in a hospital? What does it mean in a you know in a factory? What does it mean? Well, it means that you divide up the tasks in such a way that everybody has a set of tasks in their job, the sum total of which tasks are approximately as as empowering as the sum total of everybody else's tasks. And then you've eliminated this cause of class division. So let's take an example, right, Rich? I work in half my time down in the mines and then the other half, a TV presenter, say, because one, one type of job is so bad, one type of job is so good. So I balance my TV with working in the mines. Now, another person is working, say, just more in the middle type jobs. They have a balance, a different balance than mine. But the amount of crap work that everybody individually has to do is minimized by helping the person who is working in the worst conditions first. Getting the mines, getting rid of the mine work, say, for example. Say, for yeah, example. everybody has an interest all of a sudden in everybody else and improving the average as soon as you have an average balanced job complex what's your interest improve the average how do you improve the average you reduce the worst right that's what you do you 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 technology social relations etc cetera, etc cetera, to reduce the worst but i just want to clarify one thing worst and best here or better and worse here is not on sort of grounds of onerousness or, you know, something like that. It's really about empowerment. That's mm. what we're talking about now. So the task here is empowerment. If, if a particular job is sort of pleasurable but disempowering, I mean, it usually is, it, they're usually in parallel, but they're not always in parallel. Okay, that's an interesting distinction. The thing that you're paying attention to is empowerment. Now, you're also paying attention to onerousness but how do you pay attention to that in a good economy? Well, it's going to get evened out quite a bit by having balanced job complexes for empowerment. But it could still be that somebody is doing work that's more onerous than somebody else is doing. Not right. that they feel more, you know, but it is more onerous. The job is deemed to be more onerous. Well, they should get paid more income for that. One way to think of it is your income is a thing. And your job is a thing. And the combination of the two, right, should be comparable for everybody. So right. I can have more onerous work offset by more income or vice versa. I heard you talking before about some of the experiences. I think it was in Argentina post the 2000 crash about the worker controlled companies at the time and their experience. Can you tie that in here to the job complex? Sure. I mean, it, it was incredibly graphic. I was there partly visiting, partly to learn, partly to speak, and so on. And there was a, a particular session that was set up. There were about 50 people there from various workplaces that had been occupied. Now, in Argentina at the time, this happened because of the failure of workplaces, right? The economy was in trouble, workplaces were failing, and owners took a hike. And by and large, the coordinator class looked around and said, crap, we're not staying. This is failing. You know, we can market ourselves. We'll go off and get a job elsewhere. But the workers had no such option. And so they took over. So there were a great many firms in Argentina that were suddenly 
without the owner, without the coordinator class, you know, without the, the managers and the financial officers and the engineers and so on, but with the workforce. And so I was in a group that were of those kinds of workers from about 50 different places. And before we started, am I supposed to give a talk? I said, let's, let's just at least get a feeling for who's here and where, where people are coming from. So let's go around a little bit and have people give a little report on their workplace. And at the beginning, it was very animated and lively. People were very upbeat. After all, somebody from place X and place Y, they don't know each other, but they were sharing in this experience and coming together. And they were all excited. And then they started to describe their experiences. And after a little while, it was very somber. And after, I think it was the seventh speaker, there were some people who were crying. And what was happening, I'm, I'm, I'm really not exaggerating. This. this literally happened this way. They were describing the thing unraveling. We took over. We equalized or made nearly equal wages. We created a workers' council and we instituted democracy. We were all excited. And now, six, eight months later, all the old shit's coming back. And one particular person, and this was the last one who I, I, before I intervened, so to speak, got up and said, I thought I would never say anything like this. I can't imagine that I would ever say anything like this, but maybe Margaret Thatcher was right. Maybe there is no alternative. I mean, we're certainly not experiencing it beyond those moments of elation. And so what I asked was, I mean, there were two key factors. But the first one was the one we were just talking about. What I asked was, well, when you took over the workplace, what did you do about the fact that there was an accountant and there was, you know, these various people left in these jobs? And they said, well, we, we talked about it and people took over those jobs. And I said, so you didn't change the jobs. You actually had Various people who were working, you know, working class people, and before they were doing whatever rote and tedious things they were doing, take over those tasks. I said, yeah, that's what we did. And people could do it. And I said, I have no doubt that people could do it. But you think that what went wrong or what's going wrong is that human nature is fucked. I mean, you think that human <laughs> beings, right, are greedy and power hungry, and, and that's why you're all sort of facing the truth of, the, of, of your problem and getting depressed sitting here. And they all agreed. And I said, but that's not the case. What happened instead was that the old division of labor, right, brought back all the old stuff. The old division of labor elevated a subset of you, working class people by background and years of experience, elevated them, continued to relegate and, and subordinate the rest, the ones elevated begin to feel like they're better, like they deserve more, like more depends on them. And because in this structure, it's true, more does depend on them, right? And their, their role is very important. So, I mean, they're, you know, they're just looking around and seeing things as they are, and things go to hell in a handcart. And I said, the problem here wasn't, you know, your workers' council. It wasn't your ideas of equity. It wasn't your ideas of participation. It was that you, and this is what institutions are all about. It was that you kept an institution and against your will, and even of the will of the people who, who held the new roles, right? It perverted and is perverting what you're doing. I, I use the example over and over because I think it's so incredibly instructive. Like it just shows the fundamental like weakness of a lot of Marxist analysis when it comes to understanding what needs to be done. It's a core insight of the anarchist tradition that is, like for me, 100% been proved right through history. Well, I mean, look, if you have a perspective, and it's very, very powerful, and Marxism is very, very powerful, especially when it was emerging. I mean, it was revealing things about the world. It was explaining things. It had an answer for everything, right? And it was compelling. And the trouble is, after a while, those patterns of thought become highly ingrained, part of one's identity, and so on. And it's not that they were that that part of it was wrong. What it what it said about owners 
was right. And, and much that it said about the pervasive impact of economics, some of that was wrong. It over-exaggerated economics and underplayed gender and race and so on. But, but still, it found things that were true. But for some reason, it got mired down, I think. It, it's as if, if you didn't have this simple two-class thing, they, they feared that you know, their, their truth would disappear or that folks would become soft on owners or something. I don't know. But the reality was that two changes were needed in Marxism, two fundamental changes. One was, and I think this has been done, by lots and lots and lots of Marxists, right? To acknowledge and take into account that cultural relations, race, gender relations, political relations are not mere reflections of economic dynamics. They have lives of their own and they actually can impact back upon the economy. One of the ironic things about the Marxist heritage is that for them, Stalinism destroyed socialism. Well, they didn't have socialism, but it, in other words, they'll talk about the state as being able to impact the economy. But then when they put on their theoretical hat, they'll sort of rule that out. It's very strange. It's a, it's a byproduct. Anyway, so the one key thing to do was not to say economics is, is insignificant, right? That's what they were afraid people would come to. But to say economics is incredibly important and powerful, but so too is kinship and gender and culture and so on. So that was one change. And that change has largely happened as a result of socialist feminists, as a result of what you might call nationalist socialists or intercommunalists, I would call them, and as a result of anarchists talking about the political system. But the second thing that needed to happen has happened much less. And that was to realize that when you say, that a class is a group that's demarcated by economic institutions to have different interests from others and competing interests where one can dominate, then you need to take a look at more than just property. Maybe something else can have that same weight. And it turns out that the distribution of empowering and disempowering work has that kind of weight. It creates two classes that are opposed it's fuzzy at the edges, so is property, where one can dominate the other. And I think the old socialism, it's called sometimes 20th century socialism, lots of Marxists and Trotskyists like to call it state capitalism. To me, that's, that's basically saying, I mean, it's just ignoring reality. It's ignoring that the capitalists are no longer there, but there is a ruling class and it has a different basis, right? So it's almost obfuscating that. There's a phase, just, just, a, just a quote here, getting towards your concentration upon the distinguishing between, you know, mental and physical labor. There's a phase here from where I think Marx kind of gets it wrong in the critique of the Gotha program. It's just a quick line here. In a higher phase of communist society, after the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and therewith also the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished after labor has become not only a means of life, but life's prime want, after the productive forces have also increased with the all-round development of the individual and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, only then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed in its entirety and society inscribe on its banners from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Like, in that quote, Marx seems to put the the ending of mental the distinction between mental and physical labor to a later stage and that is like a key thing that your job complex i think really makes a critical part of a you know a paricon type economy going forward you know any 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 type of non-capitalist economy has to deal with that issue right up at the start yeah well you know, you can have a non-capitalist economy, a post-capitalist economy, but it's a coordinator economy, if you will, right? An economy in which the coordinator class rules instead of, you know, instead of the 2% capitalist class, the 20% coordinator class rules. Okay. And it can be better in various ways. It could also be worse, but it could be better in, in a good many ways. But it's not classlessness, et cetera. Again, I don't think it's mental manual. It corresponds to that to an extent. 
but it's empowering and disempowering because the point is, I mean, think of it this way is, I mean, I don't know what will, will be determined in the future, right? Who knows? But is being a physicist empowering? It's not obvious to me, right? <laughs> if you're sitting in a room, you're using your brain, you're, you're doing mental work, right? But you're not, you're not getting connections with other people. You're not learning things about the system that gives you an inclination to make change, you know, to decide things about the system. So it's not just menu, mental and manual. That's, that's a real thing. And it has to do with the pleasurableness of the work and so on and so forth. But for this class division, it's empowering and disempowering. There's a lot of things in that quote. And there's also a lot of, uh, how do I say this? You know, this, the, in the Soviet Union, they used to have slogans and banners and paintings. You know, the farmer feeds us all, all glory to the farmers. The worker is the backbone of civilization. All power to the workers. And, the, and we love, yeah, and meanwhile, it was total crap, right? It wasn't what was happening. And it wasn't what anybody at the top, after a, a period of evolution of the system, wanted happening. Just like that Argentine factory in microcosm. At first, they all wanted freedom, liberty, right? Dignity, et cetera, et cetera. The old division of labor blocked all of it or even unraveled it to the extent it was done. And markets do the same thing. We could talk about that later if you want to. They also unravel these kinds of accomplishments. That quote that you raised, the sentiments, the sort of heartfelt sentiment that you can feel in it, that I'm sure sort of inspires you when you read it and when you hear it, and it did me, but when I look at it really closely, it starts to fall apart, right? Even, for instance, from each according to ability to each according to need. That's a glorious formulation, very clever writing, and in practice, virtually meaningless and also not desirable. It doesn't even doesn't mean anything. Let's let's go towards that, because that is something that like I think in the quote there, in fairness to Marx, he's talking about a, a far flung many thousands of years in the future when we've thrown off the bourgeois mentality. And he doesn't say that about the here and now, but it is very, very common in both the anarchist left, say, and the left communist left to basically want to go to directly from capitalist production to each according to his ability, each according to his needs. You have a, a section in your new book where you uh, basically throw some uh, fire on this. Do you want to give me your arguments for this? Yeah, I mean, there, there are, again, two questions. Two parts to your question. One part is there's the now and there's the future. And participatory economics is a vision of an economy after victory, right? Even after transition. So if we want to talk about that period of after those things, can, recognizing that it's not tomorrow. You know, my generation, we want the world and we want it now. And we meant it. The only trouble was it had nothing to do with reality, right? So in any case, what's wrong with from each according to ability and each according to need? It's not that the sentiment is bad. It's that when you actually ask what it means, well, okay, so does it mean I can do anything I want to do and get however much I want for it? Now, I don't think any anarchist or, or left Marxist, as you described, the various constituencies, would say, yeah, what I'm for is an economy in which you get whatever you decide to take, and you give, you, you work, whatever you decide to work, at whatever job you want, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is, not, this is nonsense. Why is it nonsense? Well, first of all, some jobs you can't do, and just because you want to do them doesn't mean you can do them. I'd like to play at Wimbledon, right? That's a job. I want to see that too. Yeah, <laughs> but I can't, right? I, you know, and I couldn't be a doctor, certainly not a surgeon. And, and so on and so forth, even as a part of my balanced job complex. So one problem is you have to be able to do a job sufficiently well that you're doing socially valuable labor. All right, so let's modify it a little bit. You get what you want. You get what you say you want from each according to need. Well, I, who's going to determine my need to each according to need? Who's going to determine my need? 
No anarchist would say somebody else should determine it, right? No anarchist would say, I should get to say what your need is, right? So that means you have to say what your need is. So if you're going to say what your need is, what that is literally saying, literally, not the intention, I don't think, is that you can have whatever you say you want. That's it. There's no, you know, and, and nobody believes that. There are other problems with it. It doesn't tell society how much one thing is wanted compared to another thing, how valuable things are. It just says if somebody wants it, make it. But but somehow you have to make it despite the fact that people can work as little as they choose. What the slogan is really saying, I think, is that we want an economic system in which the institutions are such that people work responsibly to contribute social good. They, they, they want to produce things that are socially desired, and they want to do it well. And they want to get things that they want and desire, but consistent with other people being able to do likewise, which means consistent with equity, consistent with some norm that constrains me from saying I want everything and I want to do nothing, right? And this is what Paricon or participatory economics then tries to figure out. Okay, what kind of norm for income distribution? And what kind of, which is, you know, what I get, and what kind of norm for the amount of work I need to be doing to get that income is consistent with the sentiment behind the catchphrase, which in practice doesn't work. And that's what we tried to come up with. And, you know, I think we did, but that's for others to judge. Yeah, there's a line in there where you say there should be no way to improve one's consumption or work life at the expense of others. That's, that's not exactly right. It's not precisely right. So th think about it this way. Suppose everybody's got stuff, right? Now I take a little more. Well, the, the little more that I took is, is not available for you. And so you could say that I got it at your expense, right? What you want is a system which has the decision, the plan, the amounts that are going to be produced and consumed, decided in a manner that's consistent with our values about decisions, mine are self-management. So it's consistent with this collective self-management and in which the resulting situation is one in which you don't, you can't pursue your own well-being at other people's, to other people's greater detriment, right? It has to be consistent with other people doing basically as well, all right? I can't monopolize empowering work or good work conditions, right? I'm, I'm getting a balanced job complex. Well, likewise, I'm getting a fair income. Or maybe we should say what a fair income is. It isn't that everybody gets the same. If you work more than I do, you can earn more than I do. If you work harder, you can earn more. If you work at more onerous conditions, you can earn more. But those are the only ways. You can't earn more because you were born, to use the Wimbledon example, Novak Djokovic. You can't earn more because you can play tennis like him, right? You don't get money for that. You get money for having a balanced job complex in which you play tennis, but the amount you get is not a function of the amount that you produce. I mean, this is a longer discussion. I hope people will look at the book. But the, the outcome is, I hope, that you have an economy in which producers and consumers, largely the same people, but of course, some people who consume don't, aren't producers. They may be too old, they may be too young, they may be disabled, and so on. So producers and consumers collectively arrive at a distribution of activities and a distribution of rewards or benefits, right, that are equitable, fair, just, and they do it in a self-managing way. So there's no center above them. There's no, you know, periphery that's below. There's no class domination, et cetera, et cetera. Expertise is still exists and is important, you know, is, is valued. But you don't get income for that. That's one of the things that I think people critique the, the job complex for a lot is, you know, the problem of are we going to get the 
surgeon working on the garbage truck, you know, in, in inefficiency there. Can we talk a little bit about, say, like the like the gross underskilling, say, in capitalism and what that could mean for a paracon economy? Okay, so there's a million variants of this question and a million issues. So one issue is, for example, well, in participatory, in, in capitalism, 20% go through a process of upbringing and socialization and schooling and then schooling on the job, schooling at work, schooling while in the economy. And they are productive. However, they are productive with the constraint that the production that they do is consistent with their continued domination. Uh, that's a tremendous constraint. And the 80%, on the other hand, are largely robbed of a lot of their productive capacity. So, you know, go back 50 years, fill all the, you mentioned surgeons, put all the surgeons in the country into a huge stadium and look around. And what do you see? Well, it's white and male. Now, at the time, people would say, yes, that's true. I mean, nobody could deny it, right? It's true. But it's because other than outliers, you know, the occasional woman and the occasional other than outliers, uh, those other constituencies are just incapable of doing surgery. And so that's why we're all in here. Now, it's an explanation that seems to fit the facts, right? You shouldn't scoff at it too fast. It seems to fit the facts. They're all white. They're all male. The women and the blacks and the Latinos are, not, are all outside, right? So it seems to fit the facts. But we know, of course, I mean, some of us knew then, Everybody knows now who isn't literally not lying to themselves that it was nonsense, right? Uh, I think it's 51% of medical schools are women now, right? So it, it, it's a joke. It, it was false, but it had the appearance of truth and it could rationalize the situation. Okay, so now just, just change over to working class and coordinator class. And the person comes along and says, look, the 20% who are doing those empowered jobs, they're doing them, right? They're capable of it. There's output. And the other 80% are simply incapable of it. That's why it turns out the way it does, because it's wired into our genetic comp you know, makeup. Well, it's, it's just as false as the other was. It's just as much nonsense as the other was. What instead happens, as with the case of race and gender, is that this time, 80% of the population has its capacities dumbed down. The school system is designed to cause them to learn how to endure boredom and take orders, right? 80% of the country goes to school ultimately to learn how to endure boredom and take orders. The other 20% goes to school to learn how to be masters of the universe or Submasters, right? They wind up going to Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge to, to get that final step. And the final step isn't smarts, it's connections to other people and knowing how to conduct yourself and carry yourself and so on and so forth. So the efficiency argument. The efficiency argument becomes if let's say you're a surgeon. So if you stop doing surgery for 60 hours a week or 40 hours a week, or whatever the person claims, it's never true. And you have to do, you know, half that time doing less empowering and, and some disempowering work, which means what? Cleaning bedpans, doing whatever it is in the hospital, right? We'll lose half of your surgery. That's correct, right? Anybody on my side who says that's wrong needs to go to elementary school for math. If you do half less, we lose that half. And the discussion stops there for the critic. And never enters into the question, well, okay, but what about the 80%? Does the 80% have in among it, right, enough people able to be surgeons to replace your surgery? And the answer is transparently yes, just like it was with respect to race and with respect to gender. And there are places where you can see it. Let me just tell one more story that I like to tell in Argentina, back to Argentina. I'm in a plant, talking to folks in the plant, just just like as a spectator, as a as a visitor, right? And I'm talking to this woman, and she is doing the finances. Now, that's the problem that we discussed earlier. 
right? The job wasn't changed, right? So she's getting elevated. But set that aside for a minute. I asked her, I said, you were before this doing what job? And it just so happened it's a glass factory and she was working at the, you know, the ovens where the glass is melted and, and put together. And it's just, that's a tough job. Yeah. She described it to me. And I said, look, in all honesty, I don't think I'd last a day. You, you did it for how long? She said years and the same thing over and over. And she described them, you know, the motion. I said, well, now you're doing the financial books. She said, yeah. I said, well, what was the hardest thing to learn? And now she got sort of bashful, right? And she didn't really want to, you know, because it was, I guess, self-serving or uh, whatever the reasons, right? And she wouldn't answer. And I said, well, was it learning the basic concepts of accounting? She said, no, that wasn't particularly hard. I said, well, was it learning how to use the software, right, that you have to use to do it? She said, no, it wasn't that. And I, I think I came up with one or two other questions, and then I just gave up. And I said, come on, you have to tell me. And she said, first, I had to learn to read. There you go. <laughs> right? So the, And she wasn't making it up. You could t- I mean, I, you know, it didn't take a – unless she was the best actor on the planet, she wasn't making it up. First, she had to learn to read. And so she went from basically illiterate, wrote, depleted, and depressed – to, for whatever reason, doing the books and then doing them well enough so that this plant that was failing was now succeeding. And now I suppose the critic can say, oh, yeah, sure. So she was Einstein and just got discovered, right? But it's not true. It happens over and over again. People should listen to John Lennon singing Working Class Hero to understand It's undoubtedly true. How many working class people have very detailed hobbies, like technical hobbies? You know, like how many working class guys know how to like recondition their car engine? You know, people don't even think that that's a proper skill. You know, just think, oh, that's just some dude that likes a car. Yeah. And it's fascinating because at work, they might have a job in an automobile plant, right? And they hate it. And then yet on the weekend, they may do that, you know, recondition an engine. And what's the difference? Well, the difference is not the activity so much. Partly it's the activity because in one case, they're doing a sort of a more holistic thing. And in the other case, they're probably doing a more part by part thing. But it's that one is subordinate and undignified and and the other is under their own control. And so that's a fundamental change that has to happen. And that's where the self-management comes into participatory economics. On this episode, you heard the team tune the Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars.